safe to say that when we set this panel some months ago, uh, my fellow panelists did not foresee they'd be sitting up on stage with a guy who had communicated uh, clandestinely with Edward Snowden and received a substantial amount of information uh, from him. And I am, uh, with their knowledge and consent, uh, going to uh, re revise and extend the subject of today's panel to include considerable amount about what we've learned recently about uh, the NSA and what we should think of it. Um, uh, my, I don't, my fellow panelists don't need any introduction uh, for our purposes today. I'll just mention that uh, Ambassador Negroponte was the first director of national intelligence. That, uh, that was during uh, the period of 2005 to 2007, during which uh, there was a transition from the uh, Bush administration's warrantless surveillance programs to FISA approved surveillance programs, the uh, passage of the Protect America Act and the beginning of the prison program uh, that I first wrote about uh, two months ago in the Washington Post. Uh, uh, Admiral Blair uh, had the same job in 2009, 2010, which uh, coincided with a substantial period of expansion of PRISM uh, and the, uh, the immediate aftermath of the passage of the FISA Amendments Act, in particular Section 702. Uh, I want to start off, though, uh, Admiral, with, with something related uh, and that touches on the advertised subject of the panel today. Uh, certainly the intelligence community has an enormous number of uh, accomplishments, and I'm prepared to accept, and having read some of the documents, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm reconfirmed in this, that there are a lot of accomplishments and that some of them can't be talked about. Um, nevertheless, uh, while we've recently learned that we're, connect that we're collecting a lot more dots than the public was aware of, uh, the U.S. government was unable to connect the dots sufficiently on the Tsarnaev brothers, uh, even though they had been brought to uh, the IC's attention in advance. Uh, what do you make of that, and uh, what do you see as the implications of what we just heard from Ash Carter about the recompartmentalization of intelligence information? Martha, there are really two aspects of this. One is having the information available so that it can be uh, collected, analyzed, and turned into, uh, turned into action. And the other is the, the process of bringing it, bringing it together. The, the places where relevant information is available have been so widespread, so blasted out uh, uh, around it, that the old days when you could uh, if you could break into the ultra program and get the key message, that would make a difference in whether you won or lost that engagement or gone. And we simply have to go so many, many different places. It turns out that as, as reality, we can gather a lot more than we can turn into, turn into actionable intelligence. And this is a function of, uh, of, of a lot of things. Uh, we do, however, have to continue to get this information uh, into uh, analysts. We have to give them machines that will help them uh, deal with the, the enormous volumes. And then we have to have these good people who can go beyond what machines can do to use the intuition, the, the training to, uh, to, get it, to get it done. Uh, that being said, uh, it is possible to, for the intelligence community to do everything perfectly and yet for something bad to happen in the, in the United States. And the measures that the country would have to take in order to prevent those sorts of things from happening, I think would go far beyond the bounds of the intrusiveness that we want our government to have into our, into our lives. Uh, so we, we set this boundary on how much information about citizens do you want government to do so that it can make them safe and how much do you want to uh, keep uh, respect to civil liberties and privacy of, of uh, Americans? And, where we, and that is something that we have to work on and debate and, 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 and where it is right now. Uh, we can stop some things, we can't stop some other things, and that's sort of where we, where we have it. So uh, I, I think that, uh, I, I think that uh, we don't want to go any further in the in terms of gathering more data on, on Americans. I think what we do now, we do un under laws, and I think we need to get better at using what we have in order to try to uh, fend off these uh, bad actions. Yeah, I, I'll follow up with you, Ambassador, about the recompartmentalization. It sounded as though Ash Carter was saying uh, that 
a lot of what brought you into the job that was created for you, which was the obligation to share, the tearing down of stovepipes, uh, some of that needs to be rebuilt. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, first of all, that's still important, and I think uh, sharing is critical to the integration of information on a real-time basis, and uh, I, I think I'd have to wait and see what the real damage assessment is of uh, what Mr. Snowden did. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly. Obviously, he, he, he had access to a lot of information, but I think we should bear in mind here, I mean, it's, uh, it's worth repeating that uh, hindsight is 2020 vision. You can take just about any event that has occurred and then look at it retrospectively and say, why didn't I see that? So I think that uh, most things that uh, could have been done uh, were probably uh, uh, reasonably done in, in this case as in others. And, and there are situations which will escape us and incidents will occur. But the fact of the matter is, I think the country since 2000 and one is considerably safer than uh, uh, right after 9-11 because of many of the efforts that have been made to uh, integrate and improve our intelligence. And I think I, I feel that nowhere was that better illustrated than on the battlefields of, uh, of Iraq and Afghanistan, where I think we really perfected the art of integrating and forward deploying our uh, multiple intelligence capabilities so that we could bear down on targets. And I think what Stan McChrystal accomplished in basically dismantling Al-Qaeda in Iraq was a uh, phenomenal uh, accomplishment that was made in part by this integration and reform process. And I think just also by the great advances in technology that have in occurred during the past uh, decade. So let me come back to something that did happen on your watch. Uh, 2006, we now know, uh, the, uh, the government went to the FISA court and said, we have a new idea about what Section 215 of the Patriot Act means, that when we are permitted to get uh, business records that are relevant to an authorized investigation, uh, we can go and do that under a FISA order uh, in secret. Uh, and the new interpretation was that it could get all the records of all telephone calls, uh, international, national, and purely local, of every American, and store those in a giant database, and has been doing so now since 2006. Uh, why on earth would you want all that information, and how does that fit with the boundaries that the American people would expect in terms of privacy? Okay, so that's under debate now as to whether we've gone too far in terms of storing and, and holding on to that information for an unlimited period of time. And maybe Congress will revisit that. I, I don't know. Uh, but why would we do it? Uh, you just asked me, you asked us about the Boston Marathon. One of the reasons you would do it is you have all that data and then you, ha you, uh, you detain the Charnayev brothers and find out the phone numbers uh, that they've been in touch with in uh, Chechnya or wherever it's been, Kazakhstan and bounce them against these numbers that you have in file, and maybe you'll find other people who've been calling those same numbers uh, in that database. But it's not, and we gotta emphasize this, uh, it's not uh, monitoring the content of uh, Americans' conversations. Never has been, never will be. You can only do that if you've got a warrant uh, well, we'll, from we'll, a judge. We'll, we'll come back to <coughs> content in a minute, but why couldn't you, having received the tips, about the Tsarnaev brothers, uh, said then to the telephone companies and ISPs and so on, let's have your records, uh, let's have the metadata on those guys, and if we uh, want to contact chain, you still can do the same thing. Why collect it all Can in I advance? answer that? Because yeah, I was sure. involved in the follow-on sure. uh, to, to that when, when I was there. We would have preferred to have done that. We went to the information companies and said, uh, we would like to be able to come to you with a request based on probable cause and find out if this number has talked to any international, international numbers. And the telecommunications company said, you want us to store all of that data for all of that, that time in a format that you can quickly uh, access? And we said, yeah, that's, that's what we want. Uh, that's, what, that's what we need. And the answer said, no, we, we, these are billing records. We just keep them for the time we need them. And so, uh, and then we said, well, can we pay you to do that? And the answer, no, no, we can't do that. So there was a lot of mechanical there was a lot of mechanical 
uh, yeah, pieces but if, of this. If you to can learn, compel to them to hand over all the records on a daily basis that they have not why destroyed, can't, why why can't a FISA court compel them to keep the records in a certain point for, uh, in a certain format for a certain well, period of time? They already keep them for eighteen months. How long do you need them? Oh, longer than eighteen months. A lot longer than eighteen months. Yeah, I think that's the whole point. I mean, yeah. if you once you've picked somebody up who's been involved in some untoward act and has been communicating with uh, parts of the world where, where, which might have originated this activity, you then want to be able to go back and find out if those numbers in Chechnya or wherever, uh, Waziristan, have been calling uh, you know, other yeah. uh, people here in the United States. Now, and you, and you know, what's a, a reasonable yeah. period of time? Maybe that's the debate they're going to have uh, in the Congress. I don't know. But it, uh, uh, you would limit your ability to research this issue if you set a fixed period of time after which you were no longer able to keep, keep those records. But it's not going to be for any other purpose. Yeah, and here's a fact. The number of times that those records were accessed in 2012, take a guess. Okay, I'm going to give you a multiple choice, Bart. 10, 250, 10,000, 5 million. Under 300, according to the administration. Yeah, However, let's talk, let's talk about what that means. Uh, we just heard from Chris Inglis yesterday in testimony on Capitol Hill to a very skeptical uh, House committee that contact chaining on those numbers, when you pull those numbers, um, is done to two or three hops. So there's a well-deserved expression in newsrooms, danger reporter doing math, but let, 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 me, let me give it a try. Uh, let's suppose, and I think this is fairly conservative, that uh, the, the median number of unique contacts uh, for people making phone calls is 100 over the course of a year. Three hops means 100 times 100 times 100 for a potential universe of about 300 million, which happens to be approximately the population of the United States. We've all heard about six degrees of separation connecting everybody on the planet. Three hops goes very, very far. And so when they say they've only pulled 300 and then they contact chain on those, they are drawing an associational graph of at least tens of millions, assuming a fair amount of overlap, but certain, probably hundreds of millions of people. Right, right. And it's based on trying to understand the things that that person who has been identified with probable cause as being a threat to the United States uh, has done that we, we ought to know, know about. So it, it's based on, it's, it's not uh, based on random. Let me, let me take right, but, but anyways, You're prepared yeah. to justify this, but I want to talk about the the honesty, the straightforwardness uh, of the public debate. If you say 300, I mean, it was, for example, the, the, uh, the FBI was giving out, only when mandated to do so, uh, the number of times it used Section 215 over a period of years. So in 2009, when this program was in full swing, it said, we've only, you, we've only uh, submitted 21 FISA Section 215 orders. We're using it very sparingly. Now, it turns out that with three of those orders, you can get something on the order of one trillion telephone records, yeah, so, but, but which sounds point, a little different. Let me different. interrupt you. Right, uh, <laughs> are we having a hypothetical discussion here or a real one? I mean, even if that's a hypothetical possibility, you, you, you know, 10 to the power of whatever, 5. I know, uh, it's just math. But that's not, yeah, it's just math. It's not what's actually happened. Well, it is what's and actually happening. They're, they're doing contact chaining to two or three hops, so it could be as few as uh, it could be as few as three billion uh, records that are accessed when you go after uh, 300 targets, but it's a large number, a much mm -hmm. larger number than they're prepared to talk about, because mm -hmm. it sounds intrusive. Okay. Well, let, let me come at it another way, Bart. Um, I would be, I would be more enraged if I could have found a story in which the activities of the NSA had actually caused inconvenience, damage, harm to an American. Now. I have, I have not seen that, that story yet. I have not seen a person who was wrongfully identified to be a terrorist, was thrown in jail, given a fifth degree, and, and so on. Uh, this is not, I, th there's, there's been more inconvenience and damage to Americans by the uh, no-fly list and by taking off your shoes in an airport than has been by this uh, program, which is very precisely pointed towards finding people who point real threats to the United States, see who they're talking to, Follow them, follow them up under court supervision in order to identify threats. I mean, I, I, all of this stuff is potential. Uh, you know, we don't trust the government uh, ha having this, this information stuff. It's not what uh, real, real harm caused to real people by these activities which are causing real good. 
I'm not, I'm not going to debate this because I'm not supposed to be uh, the debater up here, but I'm going I'm to play, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play devil's advocate with uh -huh. you. Let's put oh, it that way. Which you haven't been and doing I, and I will, And I will, uh, I'll, take, uh, I'll take full uh, accountability for that uh, in the, uh, in, in, for our audience uh, here and uh, in the, on the webcast. Uh, it, two things I would push you on about that. One is, how would you know? if anyone had been harmed by abuse, uh, given that the program is as secret as it is. I mean, you know, Don Rumsfeld used to talk about the unknown unknowns. How could anyone possibly uh, bring in action which would discover that they had bis been disadvantaged in some way by this program? Uh, and I'll save the second question. Well, if an American came forward and said that I all of a sudden lost my job, I was thrown in jail, I was questioned for right. 24 hours by FBI agents. I was questioned unreasonably. And I, I have no reason why this came on. I think it's because I came up uh, mistakenly in, in, this, uh, in, this, in this search, and I want to know about it. I think in this great country of ours, with great reporters like you, this would have come, come out. You know, uh, there are a lot of people who lose a lot of jobs and a lot of people who are on no-fly lists or are stopped and detained at borders and all kinds of other things. And if someone comes out and tells me as a reporter, I just know it's because I've been uh, surveilled by a super-duper secret program by the NSA. Uh, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The Supreme Court specifically uh, in, the, uh, in the Clapper case said you have no standing to find out about this unless you can already demonstrate um, that you were the victim of it. I mean, in fact, there, there, is not, there is not a recourse that allows me to find out if I've, if I've uh, suffered any of these times, whether, whether this is the cause of it. Oh, come on. You, you reporters have been, uh, when you have a sniff that something is, uh, is not right, you, pers <laughs> you, you pursue it and you, and you get people to talk. And it, I mean, you're... I'm not really exactly sure how to take that applause. <laughs> That's your job. You're part of. You're part of the. Uh, you're part of the. Uh, you know, belts and suspenders and all that we put on. Uh, we, we put on this thing, and and, and I, I just haven't seen. It. It's a very careful program, in in my ob observation. If there is anything that is tattooed on the f on the heads of people who go to work in the intelligence business, is we do not spy on Americans unless we do it in a court ordered legal way. And my experience on the inside is that. The men and women in the intelligence community take that very seriously. They, they check themselves every, every step of the way, and they, they are not rummaging around uh, in, in trillions of records to try to see if they can find something interesting. They are pursuing specific leads in order to uh, find those who are connected to known threats to the United States to see if they, too, pose a threat. And, uh, that, and, and I think that's, uh, the program has done well. Well, the Admiral's expression just now about they check themselves is maybe the germ of a question I could ask you, Ambassador. Uh, besides any issues of specific harm, uh, because, I mean, it, it, in any kind of surveillance program, uh, there are some who say that the standard for demonstrating that it's a problem is that someone's stalking their ex-wife or, or, or uh, you know, something that's clearly an abuse of the program. Uh, can we trust, uh, can the American public trust very, very powerful and secret institutions to check themselves? Uh, we, in, we entrust an enormous amount of power to these institutions. Uh, is it enough to say uh, that they're, they're going well, to uh, it, watch I mean, themselves very carefully? it's not just them watching themselves. I mean, when I visited, uh, when Keith Alexander, who was director of NSA when I was DNI, took me to visit the floor of uh, these operations and all of that, it's not only the people who are monitoring uh, 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 the situation. It's the, the FBI is there. Lawyers are there. There are many safeguards. There's signs plastered all over the place and, uh, on the definition of what constitutes an American person. There's congressional oversight. Uh, there's an inspector general. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, uh, safeguards built into this. And, uh, I think we come back to the question. I remember George Bush when he talked about this program when it was first revealed by the New York Times. He says, well, when Al-Qaeda calls somebody in the United States, I want to know who they're calling. And that's kind of the underlying uh, the philosophy of this program. And I think that's its purpose. And we're talking again. It always, uh, it tends to spill over into people thinking, well, maybe we're monitoring their 
the actual content of their conversations, and we're not. These are metadata, this is records, it's effectively the outside of the envelope that is put in to your mailbox. It's that information that's on uh, the envelope, basically. And would you have... And uh, the date stamp and the postage stamp. Would you have, would you have uh, people believe that metadata um, have no significant privacy interest? I mean, I'll just say that I would rather, if I had a choice, which I hope not to have either of these choices, uh, of having my, you know, every phone conversation I have for 30 days listened to, which of course is impractical uh, to have any large number of people uh, doing that, um, or all my metadata collected for 30 days, I would much rather well, have you listen. if it was collected by Procter & Gamble or Colgate, uh, or an American corporation, then I'd be worried. And I think sometimes we don't really think about who's really, where is the real privacy problem in this country? And I'm not so sure it's with your federal government. I think it may be more with how this data is used in the private sector for marketing and other kinds of purposes. Yeah, I'd worry if my metadata was available to people pursuing uh, purely commercial purposes and who want to target me uh, for their sales pitches and everything else marketing strategies and so forth. Right, but I mean, you have the... Uh, and no, that's I, I not what this is being used for. They, could, they couldn't care less. Can I help your devil's advocacy, though, uh, Mark, with Mitch? Sure. Because I, <laughs> because, uh, I, Double super secret devil's advocacy. Yeah, but, um, but, but let me, let me say uh, seriously that uh, I believe that uh, we, those of us who were uh, senior officials in the intelligence community and, and so on, uh, should have done a much better job of explaining the general principles of these programs without um, going into titillating individual uh, cases, which do nothing but uh, do nothing but help help our adversaries. And uh, it's kind of a pay me now or pay me later. When something happens, and then you're operating from a defensive crouch of a Snowden revelations and saying, "Yeah, but we're okay," you know, uh, trust us. If we had explain these more fully in general terms, and I think they are fully explainable, uh, while maintaining security of the specific things that have to be secret, I think we would be in a better, a better off shape. As it is, we are whipsawed by revelations into sort of grudgingly putting out pieces of it that make it as appear as if we have lot, lots more to hide. And I, I strongly advocate a much more proactive intelligence structure. What, what we're trying to do in the United States is is just unprecedented. Within a democracy with all the openness and to, to conduct a, an espionage intelligence operation which inherently requires quite a degree of secrecy and yet maintain all of what we treasure about our, our democracy. And I think we have to recognize that and be a lot more forthcoming to take the mystery out of intelligence operations while protecting the secrets. So to that extent, you know, I wish We've been, able to, we've been sitting down with people like you for five years instead of waiting until Snowden gives you a bunch of information, some of which is true, some of which is in, incorrect, almost all of which is self-serving, and then you use that to sort of drag it out of us a piece at a time. So I, I think we should that's be. That's the traditional method. That's the, yeah, yeah, yeah right, that's the <laughs> yeah. old method. And I think we could do that much better while maintaining these secrets. The, the, the general, general I mean, the NSA's job is to try to listen in on conversations to discover threats to the United States. What a secret, you know. That is their job. That's what they get paid for. They have to go into an exploding area of information technology in order to be able to do that job. Therefore, they need to talk to the companies that do this. What a surprise, you know. They have to, uh, they have to make arrangements with other governments in order to have access. What a intelligence. I mean, all of this stuff we ought to be talking about in general, in general terms while not saying, oh, by the way, it's the fourth, that, it's the fourth cable pair on this transatlantic cable that uh, is the one that is, uh, uh, we're really trying to get Yeah, but I don't think that's what's getting people exercised. I mean, are you prepared to say, and this would be very different from what yeah. the uh, Obama administration is saying um, as recently as yesterday, and I'll just digress. Bob Litt, general counsel of the DNI, uh, was asked yesterday in a House hearing, uh, did you intend, did you think you could keep secret indefinitely uh, that you're collecting call data records from all Americans? And he said, well, we tried. Uh, are you prepared to say that that was a mistake, that there should have been a debate at the time that you collectively decided that, you, that, that the law allowed you to collect all the, the records of who communicates with whom, both telephony and internet data, 
and a substantial amount of content, uh, and, and not all of it with, with FISA orders, we'll get to that. Uh, should that. Should that have been a public debate before you started doing it? I would have been very careful in the wording of it. I think you're misusing the word collect. I think the word, the proper word here is store in order to be able to have access to when permission is granted. And using those terms, I would, I would, I would have been able, I would have been, yes, I think we could well, have talked about that. Well, this is the kind of term of art that I, that I, th that I think is undercutting your case. If, if, you can, if you can actually go once a day to three phone companies that have substantially all the phone records and receive in your hand a uh, set of DVDs constituting all the records of the previous day and put them in a tank somewhere and say that that's not collection, uh, that you're, you're not speaking English as most people understand it. I, I'd say you're completely speaking English as most people understand it. There are things that you keep that you have certain procedures that you can then get, get into. If you collect something, you got it. Collect something is going in and using the technical means you have in order to gather information that people think is private and that you don't have. That's collection. Storing under a court order is an entirely different thing. And I think we should openly talk about uh, what uh, the government has access to, the conditions under which it is, uh, it is uh, stored, the conditions under which it, is, it, it can then be uh, accessed, and that, that ought to be talked about publicly. Now so, but so, so you're saying that, that you know, if you frame it right, they, they should have said, we are ingesting, but not acquiring or collecting, which are the terms of art in FISA, uh, all these records. Um, this is why we think it's important. These are the safeguards. We're not going to get into all the details, but this is the big picture we think we should do and, and let the public debate that. I would not use words like ingesting, but I would say, I would say uh, taking, setting up a system so that you can uh, interrogate these records when you are, have probable cause over so many years should, should have been put out. Yeah. And I'd, and I'd say if that doesn't hold up, if Congress doesn't support it, uh, if the President doesn't authorize, then we don't do it. If they do, which, they, which the Congress did, without that public debate, I will mind you, but these congressmen are not pushovers and they did authorize it, I think it's, I think it's correct. Let, let, me, let me turn back to you, Ambassador. It, it's clearly your view, uh, the dominant view in the IC uh, in the, and in two administrations of two parties, that these programs are fine. Uh, they're natural, they're understandable, that it's only a misunderstanding that would lead people to be alarmed by them. Are you concerned about this sort of quite substantial wedge between that point of view and what appears to be uh, kind of a growing amount of shock in, in public opinion, and, and if you take yesterday's hearing uh, to be representative, uh, a view by a substantial majority of members of Congress, even on the intelligence committees, that they had no idea uh, that you were interpreting your authorities this way. I mean, is it a problem that the public is so out of sync with what you think is natural and, and normal and acceptable? Well, that, that's the way the situation looks now. I think the Admiral was making the point that this is legal, it was under a court order, it was, it was being carried out under relevant legislation. If Congress wants to, wants to change the legislation, they can change it, and maybe that'll be one of the outcomes. I'm not disturbed by it, and nor am I shocked. It just seems to me that this is a very natural part of the American political process. But I, I think, and, and, and so, practices may in some way change, and that's not going to particularly disturb me either. After all, you know, signals intelligence is very important, uh, but it's not the only intelligence uh, collection methodology that we've uh, got. There's human intelligence, there's geospatial. I mean, uh, intelligence is a very broad and, and complex business, and uh, if to come back to the topic of our, the original topic of our uh, uh, meeting. Well, can't let that happen. Uh, I think we're much better off in terms of the way uh, we integrate uh, that information. I think technology has been our friend. We've gained vast experience from these two wars that we've uh, been involved in, so that I think that we're very well positioned to deal uh, with collecting and analyzing information with regard to threats that we might face in the future. Will the threats change? Uh, certainly, and there's going to be a discussion of that here in a panel later 
on today. But I think we've uh, done very, very well against the set of threats uh, that we've been confronting uh, during these past years. And uh, I think we're, the, the intel, intel community is in very good shape at the moment. Now, all of us worry about these funding issues. And when you hear about sequesters and their impacts on things and furloughing people whose jobs are critical to our national security, that's a source of great concern. And uh, I was thinking about it, reflecting on what General Welsh was saying yesterday about the size of the United States Air Force and re re recalling my own tour of duty in the U.S. Embassy in Vietnam from 1964 to 68. When I left Saigon in January of 1968, the United States had 520,000 troops in Vietnam alone. That's the size uh, of the entire United States Army today. And our proportion, uh, the proportion of money being spent for defense and intelligence in our overall budget as a proportion of the national budget has declined substantially since the end of World War II, the Cold War, and so forth. So I, I get worried when we sit here thinking that we're going to be able to uh, squeeze water out of a rock here by uh, doing things smarter and, and with less money. I think we've cut back to the bare bones, the size of our uh, American forces, the amount of money that we're devoting to national security. If we want to continue to play the kind of role that Ashton Carter was describing towards the very end of his talk, being uh, one of the referees out in the East Asia Pacific region with rising countries like China and India, uh, we're not going to be able to do it uh, with this kind of sequester-minded uh, approach to national security. We've got to get back to some kind of approach to our budget and our national security that mirrors the responsibilities that we say we've got. And, and, and if I could just comment on your point, Bart, about the outrage on what we're doing. I, I've been to enough rodeos to um, think that I've, <laughs> I've just about got it right when an incident happens and I see outrage that we did not, we're not aggressive enough in collecting intelligence and connecting the dots and causing that to happen. Uh, I know that six months later there will be outrage that we are collecting too much information, connecting too many dots and finding too many. And so, you know, you kind of steer down that, uh, down that, down that path. Uh, I think we would be better off, as I said, steering down that path with more knowledge, both to uh, those audiences that care and follow it closely and to the general public if we uh, made it clear that that middle path that we're striking among resources, civil liberty and privacy, and getting the job done was being balanced every day and being done in a fairly uh, straight fashion by patriotic Americans. I'm going to ask one more now and, and open it to the floor, so get your questions ready. You're not lawyers, uh, but you've, uh, you've uh, had a lot of lawyers talking to you over a lot of years. And one of the points being made generally in here uh, on this panel also is these programs are legal uh, and therefore they're fine. Uh, I'm not, it's not clear to me that we know that. Uh, it's clear that they've been approved by the FISA court and the FISA court is a properly constituted court. But every effort uh, of outsiders to bring this to a court of general jurisdiction to test uh, the lawfulness under statute or under uh, constitutional principles has been strongly opposed by uh, both recent administrations. Uh, when when uh, the Obama administration succeeded in getting the Clapper case thrown out for lack of standing, uh, it said the plaintiffs have absolutely no evidence that there is large-scale collection or dragnet surveillance or that anything to do with their communications could possibly have been collected. That, that's, I suppose, literally true, uh, but it, it uh, doesn't look so good in retrospect. Why not allow any of the 18 new lawsuits, uh, that are, uh, including one by, uh, uh, by the Electronic Privacy uh, Information Center, you know, whose director is in here, say, we want to we test the lawfulness of a claim that all American call records could possibly be relevant to an authorized investigation. Why oppose that? Why not allow that to get to court? Why not let the Supreme Court make a decision on it? Well, the Supreme Court rule has ruled, has it not, that, um, that uh, business records of companies are not, uh, are not Fourth Amendment protected information, right? So pieces of this have gotten into the, uh, into the outside, outside court. Uh, but what, what, what I would say, say is that when you get to operations like intelligence operations, like military operations, in which 
you acquire a degree of secrecy to be effective for the larger job, you come up with alternative procedures to what we apply to, to uh, other forms in which, the, in which classification is not important, and you bring in good people, you set up adversarial uh, circumstances, you, you, was, you use all the principles that we use in completely open uh, issues, uh, but you have to do it in, within a closed uh, bubble in order not to be, continue to be effective. And my experience is we do that very robustly uh, uh, within it. If you came in as a, uh, as a director of communications of the uh, Office of the Deputy of Net, uh, uh, ODNI, you would get a clearance. It would be the same Bart Gilman who was just as nasty and suspicious and concerned about uh, <laughs> things, and, and, you would, and you would be... That's on my business card. Making the, making the job go. <laughs> so uh, so we, we, we replicate the procedures that America follows of authorizing stuff by legislation, uh, setting decisions by courts, supervising it by, by inspector generals, and that, that, that you said, but it has to be done in a in a uh, secret way in order that enemies don't find out about it and can therefore evade it. That's, that's the way it goes. And don't exclude the possibility of new legislation. I mean, if Congress yeah. wants to fix it, they've got oversight capabilities to hear all of this material classified and in classified form and then decide whether they think they need to tweak the law. They, they might do that. It, you'd prefer to see, I suspect, an open debate in, before the Supreme Court, but you could go the congressional route as well, right? To, address some of the issues and concerns that you've raised. Well, I guess they each have their own functions, right? right. One, one that determines what the legislation should be, one determines what the law, you know, what's lawful and constitutional. Yeah. But, uh, so, I mean, I, my preference would be that both get their shot at it, but that's, uh, that's mm -hmm. just me. Let, I, I'm going to ask only one more, uh, because I'm told there's uh, 20 minutes remaining, uh, and I want to leave time for the floor. Uh, just briefly, uh, would each of you give your observations on the uh, civil liberties oversight? board, uh, which uh, was ostensibly created when you came in, and as far as I understand, it was still essentially moribund uh, by the time you left office in 2010. Uh, is that a viable way of, of uh, overseeing uh, whether privacy and civil liberties are being honored? We moved, we didn't move very fast, but we did create it during my time, and it lasted for a while, and then I think it fell into disuse, and, the, and now it's been revived. So. Maybe that shouldn't have happened. I don't know what experience you had with the. It, it, it was dead when I, when I was there, but um, I was I was in favor of it. Uh, uh, you know, the more the more checks you have in, in this business, because it, I, I agree with your basic point that misused the power of the intelligence community can cause great can cause great damage, and the more uh, checks you have have on it, the better. So I I think it should be it should be there. Uh, the president's uh, intelligence uh, advisory board performs some of those functions. I mean, it oversees the entire uh, intelligence community from a separate viewpoint. And if it, uh, if it sees something that in, in the civil liberties and privacy area that doesn't smell right to it, it can pursue that. And, and I've uh, had some of those discussions with members of that board, which is very active. So yeah, one more, one more organization with that uh, charter would be good. OK, raise your hands. Wait for a microphone, please. Uh, and keep it brief so we could all. There's some over here. I'd say orange shirt. Uh, thank you. Oh, Chris, uh, my son Chris, Chris Isham, uh, CBS. Uh, just one uh, data point on the previous discussion. I don't have a, I have a question. It's not related. Um, the Supreme Court has ruled, I believe, that uh, that there's no expectation of privacy on metadata. So, I think that's another factor in this whole discussion that it's worth thinking about. But uh, my question really is about uh, really addressed to both both of you in your capacity as former uh, chiefs of DNI. Um, which is that uh, on, in terms of domestic surveillance and domestic intelligence, no question our international uh, intelligence has improved. We've intercepted many plots, but you know, notably there have been the Hassan case, there's the, recently the marathon bombing in Boston. Uh, these were domestic individuals uh, that were in contact with people overseas, um, and we didn't catch those. So what, how did those slip through the cracks? How do we connect those dots? How could we have done that better? And also, uh, a footnote to that, is the FBI really capable of doing domestic intelligence? Well, I think one of the things that's happened over time, say the last 
decade or two is that the definition of the national security community has really broadened, hasn't it? I mean, in the old days, during the Cold War, it was state defense CIA. I mean, if you had that sort of group of agencies together, you pretty much had the situation covered. Now with 9-11, terrorism, so forth, you've got DHS. And I think one of the major features of intelligence reform and the WMD Commission report by Silverman and, and Rob afterward was to try to rope the FBI more into this process because they'd had this habit of delegating investigations to the field. Everybody was doing their stuff on a yellow light legal pad and never sharing it with anybody else. They'd lock them up in their safes at night and so forth. And I think now there's more, after this decade that has passed, more a culture of intelligence uh, in the FBI. And I think that's been one of the accomplishments of uh, intelligence uh, reform. Uh, and then the next big thing, of course, has been empowering and capacitating the DHS to do more and better, which was, of course, a brand new agency back in 2002, 2003. And I think that's now moving apace and a lot more has happened. But these things are a process. They can't be uh, accomplished uh, overnight. I think it's much better uh, than it was, but it's going to take time. And when you think about state, local, tribal <laughs> entities, you're talking, what, 17,000 police forces in this country? I mean, we have a very uh, divided uh, police authority, so uh, monitoring some of this stuff uh, isn't so easy domestically. And I would add, my last point would be that those of us who've dealt with foreign policy and foreign intelligence always approach the issue of domestic intelligence uh, with great skittishness. It's not, I, I would say it was uh, somewhat outside of our comfort zone about how to deal with this for all the reasons we've actually just spent almost an hour discussing. All right, what, one, uh, all right uh, over here, also in the center. Thank you, Dan Raviv <coughs> with CBS. Uh, we've heard from you, Admiral Blair, that you'd prefer these programs be secretive, they'll work better. So Ambassador Negroponte, come in if you want, of course, Danny. <laughs> but Ambassador Negroponte, uh, who gets to say, trust me, only the President of the United States? Because I don't think the NSA, for instance, has a reputation that American people will trust the NSA because the NSA says, trust me. Who gets to say, trust me, so that the American you, people feel comfortable? Why don't you briefly address the, uh, the issue of trust? Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, my, you know, this is not an unknown problem in American governance. You put out what the government policy and the general pr procedures are. Congress authorizes them. If there is standing for a Supreme Court uh, or for a court case of some type, you, you follow it. I mean, I, I think these should be put in the, the general way that Americans decide big questions that trade off security, resources, and privacy and, and civil, c civil liberties. Uh, but you have to take, you can't do it uh, in, a com in a completely open way. So I'm, I'm for following uh, the, the system that this country uses to decide big questions. So Plato, Plato in his Republic would have said the nocturnal council, right? Some <laughs> hidden secret body in the back. Well, we don't do that, right? And then we're a democracy. But gosh, when you compare to what the situation was 50 years ago, the extent of oversight is just huge. I, Jim Schlesinger, who was head of the CIA 30, 40 years ago, told me once at lunch that he, there was no oversight committee then, right? No intel oversight. And, but so he'd go and brief Senator Stennis at lunch about what was going on at the CIA. And he'd start his conversation by saying, Senator, I'd like to tell you some of the things we've been doing lately. And the senator said, oh no, I wouldn't want to hear that. I mean, that was the reaction in those days. If it's intelligence and it's secret and you're doing it in the interest of national security, don't run the risk of sharing it too widely with people. And in his, he felt that just one senator was uh, already too much. Well, we've gone way beyond that now, way beyond the gang of eight. We have committees, we have this and that. So I think we're, uh, uh, we've subjected the intelligence community to an extraordinary amount of oversight. Uh, and I think sometimes what I hear the press saying is, well, we just like to see it all. And I don't think we can do that. And that still have uh, effective national intelligence. All right, I'm going to try to get a couple of quick questions asked. Uh, so let's start the microphone here with Mr. Benvenisti. Uh, and I'm going to go to the corners. Uh, that's all I think we're going to be able to do. Uh, so, so go ahead now. 
So the 9-11 Commission recommended the creation of the, DN, uh, the Office of DNI and also recommended the creation of the Privacy and Civil Liberties Board. Unfortunately, uh, neither administration seemed too eager to have a robust uh, Privacy and Civil Liberties Board with uh, authorities, subpoena power, et cetera, reporting requirements created uh, until it became fully operational uh, this past May uh, with the confirmation of David Medin, the new uh, chair. It seems that uh, all of you uh, uh, would suggest that greater transparency be injected into the process. There's a lot of misinformation and disinformation that's come out about uh, the overall practices of the intelligence committee, uh, community and particularly NSA. And I'm wondering whether you think that the Privacy Board, as now constituted, um, as we have discussed over prior years here in Aspen, is an appropriate uh, mediator of the debate that needs to happen to both uh, inform the public and to provide greater transparency, or whether that is uh, better conducted in some other uh, okay, forum. Let's, let's, let's leave it at that for the moment. And, and why don't we bring in the microphone traveling back there. Uh, I'm going to take all the questions first. What, and while uh, doing that, I'll just add on the Privacy Board. It's got, I think, what is it, five members. They're supposed to be on 20% time. And again, reporter doing math. But I think that's one full-time equivalent uh, to watch the entire intelligence uh, community. Go ahead. Question. Elmar Tevison with ZDF German TV. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, I was wondering if uh, entering the area, uh, the era of cyber warfare has acted as kind of a game changer. What I mean by that is a few years ago when North Korea attacked servers in the US, they used servers, for example, in Brighton, Britain. They had sent hackers to Japan before, which were used in the attack as well. So the enemy, the threat, can come from everywhere and anywhere. And though, so the question would be, is there an attitude now that a nation cannot afford to not collect all data available wherever they are and whatever data they are, because they have to defend and they also have to dissuade enemies and they also have to guarantee to keep superior, superiority in the world global strategic game. Okay, let's move the mic to the opposite corner. Um, you know what, why don't we start uh, answering those two, PCLOB and do you need everything? Uh, and then uh, we'll get the last question. Yeah, I would, I would say that on the civil liberty board, I, would, I don't think we should subcontract this function. I think it ought to be done by the leadership of the intelligence community inter internally. They should be talking about it. They should be setting the tone, not to say, well, whatever the CLPO puts out, that's okay, that's okay, with, uh, that's okay with us. Uh, on the uh, cyber has made a tremendous difference uh, in, uh, in the intelligence business because that's where, that's where information goes. And uh, I think that most of us who've been in the business would feel a lot worse uh, if we missed a key communications that had we intercepted it, had we interpreted it correctly, it would have saved the lives of our citizens than if we had not taken the effort to, to do it. So I, the information is exploding. We have this nagging suspicion that there may be something out there which would save the lives of our fellow citizens or, or, those, in other or those in other countries. And we're driven by uh, trying to be able to do that, interpret it correctly, get the information to the right people to, say, to say, save lives. And that, that is the motivation of 99.9% .9 of those of us who are in that business, and I think uh, that's what our citizens ought to expect, and they, and they get it. Uh, I've been given a two-minute warning, and there are no timeouts, so I think this is going to have to be the last. Hi, my name is Chris Taylor uh, with the Novitas Group. Um, Ambassador Negroponte and uh, Admiral Blair, thank you so much for your service to our nation. I wonder, two quick questions. One, is it time for a National Security Act of 2014? And is it time for us to truly sit down and talk about um, a national security budget, a true national security budget? Um, and would that help or hinder, would that have helped or hindered you in your previous jobs as DNI? Well, I, I think you might just be running the risk of opening a, a huge can of worms if you try to uh, come up with new national 
Security Act uh, legislation, at least from an intelligence perspective, I would have thought you would, uh, you might advocate new legislation if you felt that the intelligence reform simply wasn't working. And my assessment is that it is working. It's not perfect. It's not ideal. I wouldn't even have advocated it myself uh, eight or ten years ago. We t the DNI took over this, the community management staff functions of, of the uh, uh, CIA. Uh, and the, the law presented us with that outcome. I think to reopen that whole debate uh, could well be uh, counterproductive. So at least from an intelligence point of view, I wouldn't uh, advocate uh, new uh, legislation at this particular time. You know, I, it's probably a personal thing, but looking forward, uh, I, I think we do need to keep pushing at adjusting to the uh, zero minutes, huh? Okay. Here, I'm in a negative time, for those of you who are not mathematicians. Um, it's a... Uh, my indulgence of the chair. Yeah. I think we need to, I do think we need to th think in, in new ways and then implement it in, in ways that will work. I think the ghosts of J. Edgar Hoover and the ghosts of Richard Nixon have long been exercised, but they still cast this baleful influence on, uh, on some of the things we're doing. Technology has changed. Authorities have changed. No big security problem that faces the United States can be solved by one of the national security agencies that we have acting alone. They're all things that everybody has to go in, everybody has to participate in. You have to have a team, you have to have a mission. And if we can get towards that over time, uh, that would be good. Thank you very, very much, both of you. Thank you.